Happy Thanksgiving, everybody. Hope it's a good one. Hot take. Ham's terrible. Not hot take. Amari Bailey. Stud. Let's talk about it on Locked On UCLA. You are Locked On UCLA, your daily podcast on the UCLA Bruins. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Well, today's very special Thanksgiving episode, short one as it may be, is brought to you by Bet Online. Bet Online is the place to get your betting fix. It's got the best odds, props, and lines, and got you covered with more than ever before. Bet Online, where the game starts. And meanwhile, it's Happy Thanksgiving. Zach Anderson, Yock Cyber. Thanks for making Locked On UCLA a listen on this day, not just your first listen, but a listen on Thanksgiving. In the meantime, you can get your podcast for free wherever you get your podcast, and it's available on YouTube if you so please on this Thanksgiving day. If not, well, maybe you're just driving and you're like, well, you're still having a turkey sandwich with the leftovers. Either way, UCLA basketball comes and responds with an absolutely angry, angry, angry performance, which you hopefully aren't with your relatives with the type of performance they laid on Pepperdine. Man, oh man, Mick Cronin laid it on Pepperdine. I mean, excuse me, on UCLA, and the, the Bruins laid it on Pepperdine. Mick Cronin laid into his team, was angry, vocal in the media, and sometimes you see the coaches frustrated and they lash out the media. No, he was lashing out vocally to his team just with the microphone in front of him. He had a microphone, we'll pretend this pen's a microphone, and was holding it and gladly saying in his mind, what was needed to be said in his mind about his team's performance against some of the top teams of the country, Baylor and arguably Illinois. And the Bruins didn't even face the best team that weekend, which is Virginia, which is what he knew. So UCLA came back, took down Pepperdine, who has had a nice start to their season. We'll see how they fare in the WCC after it's all said and done. But was I expecting a 50-point win? Absolutely not. Maybe a usual 20 to 40 win, but not only did UCLA pour it on, they scored and played some defense. And as I teased, Amari Bailey, who had some great quotes after this one, let's get to his stats. For a guard for UCLA and Amari Bailey, who had struggled in the early portion of the season in terms of his freshman, you know, the product overall from Chicago and eventually finished with Sierra Cannon in high school and Overall, came to UCLA, highly rated recruit, high expectations for the Bruins and Bailey individually. And in the beginning, he had 10 points on 10 shots, 14 points on 15 shots against Norfolk State. He had 11 on 6, but then over the weekend against some top-tier competition, 6 points on 10 shots. And it was pretty clear, in addition to 4 turnovers, was he... Still learning how to play at the D1 collegiate level against the best teams. Well, against Pepperdine, he played 25 minutes, 12 points. I mean, 12 shots, 19 points, made all of his threes, three rebounds, four assists, zero turnovers. And you can tell that's a that's a type of performance that gets you going. And what did he say post game? Let's talk about what he said post game. This is really indicative of what he said. They say you judge a man by how he handles adversity. So just come bound to, so this is how what he said. So they say you judge a man by how he adv- handles adversity. So just to come back and bounce back collectively as a group, not just me individually, it just so happened to be my night. But collectively as a team, we all put it together. That's the freshman Omari Bailey sitting there next to Jaime Hawkins Jr. with his quote post game saying, hey, 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 hey. It's not necessarily all about me. I just had the good shooting night. Although if he has shooting nights like that down the way, down the stretch, throughout the rest of the season, well, maybe the expectations for UCLA still are sky high. Look at Arizona. They just won the Maui Jim Maui. That is, despite the preseason polls, the top dog in the Pac-12 that UCLA has to strive to beat in conference and then build towards when it comes to their marquee non-conference matchups to left against Maryland against the likes of Kentucky, 
and then they build towards conference season, which will be an entertaining season nonetheless, despite a very poor Pac-12 start in the non-conference outside of Zona, one might expect. Yet UCLA, watching very mature post-game answer from Amari Bailey, talking about how, hey, it's a collective effort. And it was a team effort against Pepperdine. Let's talk about it. UCLA overall, 55% for the game, almost 60% shooting in the second half, 70% from downtown, 7 of 10 threes, making 16 of their 20 free throws overall. They shot well. They dominated in the paint. The Bruins had 42 points in the paint, nearly half their points coming in the paint having a good portion of free throws, made free throws, points in the paint, and then UCLA hit 10 threes, counting for 30 of the, 30 of the, uh, what should we call it, points, you know, you know what I'm saying, 30 of UCLA's century mark that they hit last night. And it wasn't just Bailey who had a good night, 19 points for Bailey. Jaime Jaquez put in 17 and 8. Jalen Clark, 12 points, 6 rebounds, 2 assists, 2 steals, and overall, in 38 minutes, 12 points on six shots, a stat stuffer in every great meaning of the word. Jalen Clark affects the game in so many ways. A Dembona in the double figures, 11 points, seven rebounds. Nice to see the big fella be a plus 19 while being on the floor. You had Tiger Campbell, who didn't have the best shooting night, but didn't turn o- had two turnovers, 11 points. But again, even though Campbell didn't have the best of nights, you saw David Singleton still shooting hot from the field, 13 points. You saw Mick Cronin use almost everybody off the bench. You had a total of eight guys off the bench, I believe 13 separate players, almost getting at least two minutes for UCLA. And the big thing was only nine turnovers. And defensively, they forced 17 Pepperdine turnovers and Pepperdine shot atrocious from the field, 35%, not atrocious, but 28% from the field in the second half when UCLA just pulled away and dominated. Pepperdine shot 22% from three, and UCLA didn't send the waves to the line. So overall, UCLA forced those 17 turnovers. What did they do with those turnovers? Well, Mick Cronin would be proud of this number. UCLA ended up putting in 28 points off turnovers. That is forcing turnovers and using that to your advantage and dominating the game. A stout performance for UCLA basketball in a game I did not think would end up like that. Probably a UCLA win and probably won by 15 or more, maybe in the 20 points or more category where they would I thought they would win. But to dominate like that, that was an angry team. And people might think shades of last season, right? Where they went to Vegas, they played Bellarmine, and then they got to play Gonzaga after that. And UCLA was not ready, you know, to handle Gonzaga on neutral site. Gonzaga, if we remember, almost a year ago, the Bruins lost by 20 to Gonzaga on a neutral site. The night after holding off Bellarmine, who they play next at Poly, who's been a bit of an upstart now as a new D1 to college basketball, the Knights beating them by 13 the night before. They then just dominated UNLV on the road after that, holding them to 50 points, held Colorado to 60, beat Marquette, and held them to 56 points. And then that's when COVID hit, and they had to wait three weeks for a game after COVID hit again. This year, UCLA, think about it, had not only just one ugly national television debacle, they had two in the span of a weekend of two very good teams and even angrier Mick Cronin this year as UCLA found themselves looking for answers heading to the Pepperdine game. So this very well, with UCLA's upcoming schedule, could very well be a nice, nice touch, mind you, going forward into what could be a very successful campaign into the first week of Pac-12. We'll talk about that, but not before we should tell you about we're, we're not, I don't, you know, there's lots of games on during the Thanksgiving weekend, Feast Week, basketball, so much fun. World Cup BetOnline has all the latest odds, props, scores, latest news. They've got it all. They've got the latest trends, every professional, amateur league out there. Your number one source is BetOnline 
for sports betting information, stats, news, and analysis. If you if you love sports podcasts that get your betting fix, go check it out with Bet Online. They are the fastest and easiest way to get your betting fix. Head to the website or use your mobile device to learn more. Bet Online, where the game starts, where it starts, and where we start this kind of end slow wrap with the likes of Locked On UCLA today, Zach Anderson, Yoxheim. We're talking basketball. An angry Bruins team dominates, 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 dominates Pepperdine. And again, a lot of guys getting in all the way from the walk-on from Sierra Canyon, Russell Strong as well, not the walk-on from Sierra Canyon, but the Cremonesi, Mac Etienne, uh, Bravo Zonka, Dylan Andrews, Nuba, Singleton, as you can, everybody mixing in. And the Bruins did not have a single player on the floor against Pepperdine who had a plus-minus less than plus five. Pepperdine had nobody in the floor with a positive plus minus. If you get really analytical with it, they are at least at the worst, the back of their bench, a minus eight. So either way, from the back of the bench to the starters, the Bruins dominated through and through against the Lorenzo Romar led Pepperdine team, who is still four and two and actually had a better record than UCLA coming in. You could point to schedules, whatever it may be. This is what UCLA basketball schedule looks like going forward. Following all the festivities with football, you get the Bruins, they get Thanksgiving week off, weekend slightly. You get Thursday, Friday, Saturday off, digest the turkey, get your naps in, eat the extra turkey sandwiches, get your naps in, eat the potatoes, get your naps in, don't eat the ham, that's nasty. What? We'll we'll talk about that. And then they go into, after Bellarmine, first week of Pac-12 play. They go to Stanford and then play Oregon at home. Games that may have thought it, you know, might have thought to be tougher. Stanford looked as a dark horse to win the Pac-12. Oregon stumbling a little bit early, but maybe they'll figure it out and there'll be a Pac-12 threat and maybe an at-large tournament team. We have to see how everything plays out, especially through the month of December. Still Maryland and Kentucky to play in December, but as UCLA prepares for the last November game, very well, the Bellarmine team that could shock some people and do it again. They've already won their conference tournament. Last year, but ineligible, still transitioned in Division I officially. So they couldn't make it to the NCAA tournament, even though if they were eligible and they were put in their conference tournament, they would have gone. UCLA had to scrap against them. Bellarmine went. They've beaten Louisville, who is not the best team in the ACC this year, let's say, in basketball. And yet, the Bruins find themselves looking for a dominant stretch. Maybe this is an angry team that'll go through and dominate Bellarmine and then go against a Stanford team on the road that should not be taken lightly, especially in national television against the Cardinal, that from what I've seen, especially in person, they can shoot the three. They are a sneaky, tough team to beat. They've only lost to San Diego State at home, and they had to play at a baseball diamond against the likes of Wisconsin. It's tough to shoot at a baseball diamond when your basketball team in Milwaukee on the road at a quote-unquote neutral site. So the Bruins will have their hands full at Stanford. Yet, let's see how this trans this movement goes forward. You have an angry Mick Cronin. You know, you, you, whether you've played from youth to high school to college, you all know there's a coach, whether you played or whatever, you are that coach. They either lit into you or a coach, like, you know, you had to light a fire underneath your players. You got to light a fire in your players. It's like, all right, psh, let's go. Get them ready to go. Mick Cronin did that. Let's see how long this wave goes and how long it goes into maybe does it go for the rest of the year? Or is it a four-week, three-week successful rate heading into the the holidays and the new year? And then UCLA has to, you know, get another spark, and Mick Cronin does it again. But there's no wake-up call like playing teams you need to beat down the stretch in March, whether it be conference tournament teams or let alone your own conference in regular season. And then when you get to March, most importantly, these are the teams you have to beat in the Sweet 16, Elite Eight, barring stumbles from an Illinois or a Baylor or someone else, and you get a tough first or second round matchup. You find a North Carolina who got red hot March, and UCLA needs to be ready to beat those teams. That's why Mick Cronin is sending the message that he is, saying, we weren't ready to play, and this is early this season, but youngsters need to learn and learn quickly. Otherwise, they could be on upset alert or, you know, a team that's good, but not great. And UCLA has great expectations, which is what Mick Cronin has brought back to the program after kind of falling under the radar with Steve Alford. And 
despite that entertaining Lonzo Ball year, very mediocre, you know, tenure one would say for Steve Alford in terms of keeping UCLA truly relevant after the Bruins got rid of Ben Hallens, after he had those great years earlier in his tenure and then slowly fell backwards. But yet UCLA has themselves in a spot where they want to be dominant. If they want to be dominant, they got to use that fire and continue that defensive prowess that Mick Cronin prows him, you know, prides himself on. But the question is, can Amari Bailey play like this? Will they get double-figure scoring from a Dembona as consistently as they did? Can Jalen Clark continue to be an, a, very, a very efficient shooter, extremely efficient, six shots, 12 points? That's a way to do it and be a team-leading plus 38 against Pepperdine while including rebounding half the time, getting a couple assists, hands in the passing lanes, a couple steals, getting back in the you know the steals category after a weekend off, if you might say, in terms of getting steals against some tougher competition. The real question is, can Bar- Bailey continue to do this? And maybe he doesn't need to lead the team in scoring every night, but can he do 15 points on... The eight shots, you know, more like a Jalen Clark. Can he do it on nine to ten shots, relatively efficiency, while the Bruins wait for Tiger Campbell to get his feet underneath him and continue to be the leader that he is while finding a more efficient shot? If not, maybe those shots go away from Campbell and he turns more into a facilitator as the Bruins go elsewhere with shots. Maybe Singleton takes ten shots a game with his efficient shooting. A spectacular three-point shooting start for David Singleton. These are all questions that can be answered going forward as we start Pac-12 play pretty soon. Yeah, all right. All right, that's that's where we go, right? To wrap up this episode, I know maybe you guys were expecting football, but we'll talk football on Friday because we'll have the preview, mini preview, and then we'll have the reaction afterwards against Cal. So we'll go with UCLA football in the next episode for Locked on UCLA. In the end, let's get spicy. Let's talk Thanksgiving and all the good stuff. We're thankful for our friends and family, my girlfriend, everything, fans, family, colleagues, coworkers. We're thankful for all that. I thank you for dealing with my nonsense if you're listening at home or watching. Let's talk Thanksgiving meals. We all have our favorites. My controversial thing, maybe, maybe you don't, is the likes of ham. I don't like ham. I'm a turkey guy. Um, generally the, you know, the white meat, I can have a little bit of dark meat. It doesn't really matter, but either way, turkey, you get some gravy, you get the mashed potatoes, you just mix it all together there. And what was, you know, a shocking discovery. And with all the locked on college hosts throughout the whole brand, we had a big group chat meeting and there are people in the group chat during the Thanksgiving morning that were saying mashed potatoes are disgusting. And I am just, what is, what, what, how do you just not like mashed potatoes? I don't understand it. Someone must have not given you good mashed potatoes going in your ah. There's one thing to talk about. Sweet potatoes, yams, sweet potato pie, pies and everything, you know. But mashed potatoes, oof, that's a tough take. I mean, there could be a bad mashed potato and you just, I, I just don't get it. I like mashed potatoes are my favorite form of potatoes. I mean, I guess if you include a French fry, but we're not talking about that. In the meantime, let me know in the comments or tweet at Locked On Bruins, the show Twitter. And say what you're what you're thankful for this year, and what's your most controversial take in terms of Thanksgiving food. Even if you see this later or watch it later, listen to it later, whenever it may be, just come back, post on here your favorite Thanksgiving dish with your favorite Thanksgiving dessert, and then add on into your favorite or your least favorite and most controversial Thanksgiving. Food take. Thanksgiving food take. In the meantime, I'll say, love me some turkey, mashed potatoes. Wasn't a big stuffing guy growing up, but now I've fallen, I've, I've fallen for it. And then ham, no, no ham. Not a sweet potato guy. Not, a, not really a yams guy. Man, whew. dessert. Apple pie has truly grown on me. I've always loved pumpkin pie. Initially without the whipped cream. Now I think it needs some whipped cream. And then finally, nothing beats my grandma's homemade signature yogurt pie. I marked that. Boom. Yogurt pie with granola, cinnamon. It's awesome. That beats all the desserts. That's how it goes. It's as simple as it gets. Let me know what your favorite takes are with Thanksgiving. Hope you have a good one with your family. And throughout the holiday season, as I know it'll be interesting, diving through the rest of the football season 
getting into the meat of basketball and soon Pac-12 play right around the corner. But enjoy the day. Enjoy your family. And let's be thankful for everything that we have. Thank you. And uh, enjoy Thanksgiving. Enjoy the rest of your day. This has been Locked On UCLA. One, a clap, baby. And one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. You, C, L, A, U, C, L, A. Fight, fight, fights. This has been Locked On UCLA. Go Bruins.